I was one of the top 11 or top 15, should I say, in my school, which is an, an achievement, right? The, the way that I enjoyed learning wasn't this like sit down in a classroom type of vibe. A kind of middle finger to the educational system that like, I ain't doing this shit anymore. Every single night I drive to work, I'll be like, oh, I'm going to quit. Yeah. Every night for like two years or that, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. Or if you don't 100% believe in your idea, you might as well just not start. He turns and luckily I kind of like swerve and go up on a hill. I've got my van, I'm like up on a hill, right? And at that point I was like, oh yeah, I'm gone. Yeah, I said, yeah, I'm gone. <laughs> No, I can imagine. Um, with every day that goes by, it's like step by step, brick by brick to keep on growing. And with you being like, I guess in the centre of when we talk about UK drinks, UK brands, La Solas, the rum, everything like that. If we take it back, did you ever see yourself having some kind of like alcoholic beverage? Like, did you see this as part of your journey? I mean, like, no, when I first like, you know, was thinking about entrepreneurship or, uh, you know, having something on my own. No, alcohol was definitely not an industry that I looked at because it's such like a, it's a, once you're in it, mm. it's like a whole world, it's a whole ecosystem. Everyone kind of knows everybody. Everybody, like, it's just this, like, underground type of system that's going on, right? And um, people just don't know it exists, right? It wasn't a... You know, if I go into, like, I don't know, secondary school or whatever, it's like, you know, you shouldn't be going to secondary school. But if you ask the young person, like, oh, have you ever heard of alcohol brands? They'd probably say, yeah, but it's like, oh, do you know how to get into the alcohol industry? Or do you want to get into the alcohol industry? Or mm. if I go to university, say, 18-year-olds or whatever, and you say, oh, listen, you know, do you want to get into the alcohol industry? I feel like the question, the next qu the question I'd get it would be, like, how? Yeah. Like, how? Like, what jobs are there, right? Mm. I didn't know, you know, there's, like, so many things you could do there, right? So... I think um, that's obviously by design because you shouldn't be um, thinking about alcohol, thinking at, about alcohol at, at those <laughs> times. But also, um, when you come from like where you come from, the, you know, some of the, your imagination is limited, mm. right? And um, so what was on your mind at that time then? Like property, like the only thing I was like property, my construction business, like a construction business. Mm. Um, there was like nothing, um, not to say that property isn't creative because obviously we've seen on like Instagram where there's different like accounts and they do magical things with homes and stuff like that. But there was nothing really outside of my box, right? Mm. It was just like, oh, this kid from Newham, he has entrepreneurial dreams. He feel like he's, he feels like he's gonna be, he feels like he's gonna be, he's gonna be rich or whatever. And it's like properties or cars. Mm. Right, that's the only thing I could see, and I like, and I, I got to a point when I was looking at properties and cars. I was like, okay, you're not gonna make it as a footballer, like that's not your journey. Mm -hmm. So properties or cars, right? And um, so I, I'm gonna pause you there quickly because yeah. you you skipped over the football thing very yeah. quickly. So you have seriously considering becoming a pro, pro bowler. <laughs> There's one thing about seriously considering. <laughs> 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 another thing about being good enough right so yeah, yeah, yeah. you know i was I, I was okay right i was okay i, I started football really late okay right and How um old? i think i like to be like as in properly maybe 10 or 11 mm. 12 should i say and in like football terms that is you know that is so so late so when i think about like when i started and uh what i achieved which was obviously it wasn't nothing but what i eventually uh you know, like the teams I played for or the people I played with or the people I played against, in reflection, I'm like, oh, wow, you done massively well considering you started from like ground zero. Like I yeah. started at 10, 11, I remember playing in my area and like missing the goal from like one yard out, like 10, that's how bad I was. I was mm -hmm. last pick to when I get to like 16 or whatever, I'm like athletics captain and I'm, you know, I'm part of the 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 squad every single every single week or whatever, and I've got trials for this person, and I'm playing against this person. And I play for my district, and I played against Harry Kane, and I, I went in trials, and I played against these, and I've played against academy clubs, and I scored against academy clubs. When I think about my journey, I'm like, oh, like they, they, there was a switch where I was like, oh, I want to be really good at football, mm. so I'd go to the park and I'd practice, like I practice, 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 and I got to a point where I wasn't the best by any uh, by any means or I probably wasn't like the top five but I was one of the top 
11 or top 15, should I say, in my school, which is an, an achievement, right? From somebody who was probably not top 100. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, like I did well. And then when I got to like sixth form, I had like my last serious trial um, to, to, to a team. And to be honest, like the trial... I'm happy like it didn't go well because like there's a lot of like funky stuff when you go to like football club especially at that time where um especially at that time where like racial issues wasn't at forefront there was a lot of funky stuff and I come from like Newham and I come from a place where I didn't understand what I don't know if quote unquote what this type of banter was mm. this was so super foreign to me so me being myself and being me being outspoken you know I just I kick up a fuss in the dressing room I remember kicking up a fuss in the dressing room about something that happened to another another kid and from then they just outcasted me from that trial and that's when I really fell in love with football after that moment I was like you know what this is done it, oh. I wasn't going to make it anyway so mm. this is definitely not an excuse but it was like the love for it had disappeared straight after that and I was, I was out I was out Oh wow So at that point When you've fallen out of love With football yeah. So then Did you kind of feel lost Because with a lot of people When they kind of Put all their eggs in the basket When it comes to football mm. And life after football At that age It can feel quite Yeah you feel lost mm. Kind of thing Like what were you trying to Figure out would you So say? I was still playing it Because it was like My friends play it um, it was something to do it was sociable it was like a, it, was a, it was a sociable thing to do but in regards to like putting in extra hours and really loving the game mm -hmm. I didn't really love the game like that anymore I'd like train once a week which is like again not not good enough if you're mm -hmm. trying to be professional um, and then I remember getting kicked out of sixth form in my first year so the trial was my first year of sixth form then I got kicked out of, of sixth form um, and then uh, I was looking for a college and then I went to a football college like on trial and then the because the football college already have like they so they're linked to a secondary school mm -hmm. so they already knew like some of the players that were just going to go to the college anyway so I didn't have do that and then I went to another football college and got into that and it's interesting because even though like all of this is with hindsight me saying that I kind of fell out of love with football even though at that time like I was going to a football college and then I was doing some next course, like, I don't know, physiotherapy or, or whatever. I don't even remember what that qualification was. Um, when I got to the interview, they asked me, oh, what do you want to be? Right. And I said, oh, I just want to be a property developer. Mm. Right, and it's, it's funny because they, they like people say that their teachers laugh, but but they, they generally laugh. Like <laughs> this is not the thing where they say, "Oh, my teachers laughed at me," because none, most of my teachers never laughed at me. If I'm yeah. being honest, right? Yeah. This is the only time I'd experienced that. <laughs> right, but it's true. You're in a football course. Yeah. You've just got kicked out of sixth form. Why the hell are you talking about property development? <laughs> it doesn't. It, doesn't, it really, truly really doesn't even make sense, right? Yeah. Like, um, and. Um, I had, it's so funny, I, sorry, just before I went there, I went to, actually, I was on a property course, like, it was, like, it was a course, it wasn't about property, it was actually, it was a very hard course, it's um, about, like, quantity surveying and stuff mm -hmm. like that, and I was, actually, funny enough, on the course with uh, Tommy Mallet. Oh, which is crazy. That's like, mad. Yeah, yeah, it's mad. Yeah. So, so on that course, and then for me, I just got lazy. I was like, you know what? I want to go back to football. So, yeah, took took this easy course. Said I was going to be a property developer. Everyone laughed, um, and then um, yeah, just I think I was just coasting. But also at the same time, there's like you know stuff going on in the area. It's a bunch of bad stuff, and you know I think I think I think a lot of these things are like divine intervention, mm. right? Because uh, at that time, I was so distraught that I got kicked out of sixth form, that I was kind of leaving my era, leaving all the friends that I grew up with in secondary school. But looking back at it now, I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Mm. Like, oh, if I was in that area, if I continued to be in that area um, and continue to hang around the same, God knows where my life would have turned up, right? So, yeah. yeah, I think everything happened for a reason. I coasted on the course for like two years. The, 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 educational, the educational side of the course was easy me and my friend me and my, my 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 close friend we we didn't even revise for anything it was like just very very easy it was mm. very basic um and just end up playing games and yeah still coasting and trying to do the football thing while trying to figure out the entrepreneurial thing in like the background mm -hmm. yeah. it's something to be said about like going to different areas and meeting different friends because um what you said resonated with me because like my 
secondary school was in a different borough. Mm. My college was in a different borough. My uni was a different um, city. Mm. And when you have all of those different circles or different communities, it just makes you a more well-rounded person. And it keeps you away from the nonsense back home as well. 100%. Because when I, when I look at my friends back home, I'm like, right, hardly any of them have like moved. I'm not, saying, not, not to sound bad or disparaging or anything like that, but like they don't have a lot of the experiences that might have come by going to different places or like even just by studying in a different like borough just makes such a big difference, you know? 100%. Yeah. So with your entrepreneurial thing, so was that the property, um, was it the property kind of aspect? That's what you were thinking about while you were studying. That's yeah. what you wanted to do. Yeah, because again, it, it seemed like low hanging fruit, mm. right? Um, again, like all of these, these, these kind of like media, understanding why I wanted to do a property, uh, it comes with hindsight. And now when I look at me saying property, I'm like, oh, this is like the quickest way to wealth. Yeah. Right. Um, it, it, I now know it takes a bit more than, oh, taking some money, buying a house and flipping yeah, it. Yeah. But at that time it was like, oh, I'm going to save up some money, buy a house and flip it and keep building my way up and I'm going to, you know, become this person. And <clears throat> that might have been my journey, but there's good chances that that probably wouldn't have been my journey. Mm. But that was just that. I was just thinking of low-hanging fruit. I wasn't thinking outside of what I had, what I had seen or what I've heard or mm -hmm. what I've heard people do. It was just about investing in property. And then eventually it was like investing in cars. In cars. Okay. So yeah. as you were doing this, were you thinking about uni? Or was no. that not so in like when as soon as I the day I got kicked out of yeah. uh, my sixth form and my dad was driving me home, I turned to my dad. I said, "I'm not going to university." Is it because you got kicked out? Yeah, I said straight away. I said, "Oh, I'm not going to university," um, and um, it was an emotional decision. Cause I was I was, oh, I was so distraught. Right? Imagine you, from your seven to your twelve, mm. all your friends, you're gone. Mm. Right? Um, and um, yeah, I just turned to him and said, I'm not going to university. I'd been thinking about it before, yeah, right? But um, I think it was me coming to terms that the, the way that I enjoyed learning wasn't this like sit down in a classroom type of vibe. Um, I'm very much a visual person, very much, you know, a doer, right? Um, you know, as times progress, I've kind of improved all of these other things. But at that time, I, I learned in a certain way. Um, and also... <laughs> it was kind of like a, a kind of middle finger to the educational system that like I ain't doing this shit anymore, mm. right? Um, but yeah, so there was no university in my mind. Okay, got it, got it, yeah. got it. So then you just start, so you finished the course there, so you just like went, went straight into work then? Yeah, so I started to, so I, I spent a year just trying to figure out what I wanted to do after I finished. Um, and I don't think I'd started cars yet, mm. but then I, I definitely, then I started, then my, actually my mum was onto me. My mum was like, listen, like, <laughs> bro, like, what are you doing? Yeah. You got to like do something. All right. And um, I'd done like a few courses before. I, I, and I mentioned that obviously I was getting, so the way how I was approaching property is I wanted to get all of my trades mm. and like fix property myself. Mm -hmm. So again, while doing all of these things, I'd like done like a decorating course uh in the evening or like part time so i got that and then my mom was like all right cool you're interested in doing property why don't you get like an apprenticeship in like decorating so if that's what you want to do why don't you do that so um it wasn't it was kind of weird because it wasn't like a domestic like oh house opportunity but it was like uh basically it was the regeneration of baker street station mm -hmm. So they were doing a big revamp of Jake Baker Street Station. My mum knew someone, got me a job as like an apprentice painter and decorator or whatever. And I brought my boy in and it was kind of like a laugh, right? Because the site manager loved me and my, like loved me and my boy. Like he, the site manager was like, like he used to call me and my boy his son. Like, oh, like that. he, like he loved me, like, and the thing is, there was a lot of, when you, when you're in those type of environments, there's a lot of people, there's, there's a lot of great people, but there's a lot, a lot of people who just don't like you for one, for one reason or another, right? Mm -hmm. So we faced a lot of that, right? But he always had our back, right? Always had our back. So we did that, I learned some skills, was on like a massive project. And then when the cross roll, which is obviously the Elizabeth line and stuff like that started, um, got some word that we can get into like uh, electrical engineering, but you need to start from like the bottom, you need to like build your courses. Actually, let me go back to the paint and decorating thing. So funny enough, I was at that site, I was doing paint and decorating, but then again, I've always wanted to do more. I'm somebody that I'm not happy just doing this. So you can pay for private courses to build yourself up and whatever. So yeah, I started to do that, 
right? And that started to impact some of the relationships in work because, you know, you have people that have this hierarchy over you and they, they kind of want to treat you a certain way because you're young and you from come from a certain background. And as I started to kind of move up, started to get really awkward, trying to get me off site, no reasons or whatever. But again, as I said, the guy always had my back. And it is so crazy. I was like the last person on that whole project, mm -hmm. right? So me and the guy's actual biological son were the last two people on that project because he loved me so much, yeah. right? Um, so yeah, then the crossroads started and I, like there was a way to kind of, you could start uh, like, like you could do some engineering stuff. So you have to build your way up from like the very bottom. Mm. So did that. So stayed on the crossroad for two, three years. And I think when I was there, so I think between the uh, painting and the decorating stuff, because it was nighttime, we got paid decent of money. And then the crossroad stuff, we got paid good money because it was nighttime. Started the car thing. That shit was just terrible. Like that was like no business planning, mm. car buying cars that we shouldn't have bought, right? Buying cars like, you know, we're buying like a a 2.2 Ford Fiesta Z Tech, like for crazy money, but nobody wants to buy that off you because the <laughs> litre is so high, right? We was just doing some, some like we saw that first P Peugeot 206, I remember. I think we might have made 400 pound and we thought, oh yeah, this, yeah, is, up, up, yeah. this is us. Easy right? money, this, yeah. this is us. That other, we bought a Red Oak gang and two litre as well. <laughs> like we were just making silly decisions, but I said to say like that was uh, short lived. We also actually, funny enough, like the one that really killed it for us, I think, did this kill it for us or the one that we started? So the, our first lesson, we bought a car, new Ford Fiesta uh, Z Tech, uh, but it was like new, like it was one year old, um, and or it might have been the same year. We bought it from auction. We parked it outside our friend's house, and it got stolen. All of our money, boom, no Go insurance, on. no nothing, done. We said, you know what? We said, you know what? We was down about it, but we went back and we 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 reinvested again, and um, and we bought like three smaller cars, right? Mm. So instead of like this one big car, or whatever, I can't remember how much it was at the time. It might be like five or six grand, I can't remember. We're like, you know what? Let's divvy our money between these cars. First one sold, the, the rest was a mess. They ended up getting told. We had to buy, we had to pay for them to get told back. But also we had to like road tax them. It just, mm. We said, you know what, this ain't us. We, we just don't. And again, thinking about it now is like, there was no business planning. There was no plan. We was just vibes in it, yeah. right? You know, we had worked and we're just re trying to reinvest all of our money back into this thing and it just weren't working. So anyway, uh, I was on a crossroad at the time and the crossroad was interesting because you, under you start to understand like some of your parents or you start to understand people in life where you're in this job, whether it's high paying or whether it's not, but you eventually jump on the hamster wheel. And when I got there, I was definitely on the hamster wheel, right? I was like, okay, um, this is a l good money. It's nighttime. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not really, um, I'm not really going over and board. Like, I'm not doing crazy stuff, right? It's very easy. It's a very easy job. Getting paid. Um, I've got my daytime to myself. But after, like, a, I feel like after a year or two, I was like, this. Like, I'm not. I'm unfulfilled. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm unfulfilled. This is not great. Um, and I, I'm always, I'm, I've, one of my things and one of my sayings is that like, especially our generation is someone has to bear the cross, right? Meaning, um, someone has to do something extraordinary to put, to bring your family out of whatever, right? Whatever situation your family's in, you, someone you, you, like this job is not, this is not the cross. This is not what I'm supposed to be doing to take us to the next level, to take my generations to the next level, to make sure that my parents have, you know, whatever, how long they have left on this earth, they have that comfortability, right? So that was always on my mind. And obviously I've always been entrepreneurial. So you, you've got these things kind of swirling around. You're also in an environment where, again, like they want to keep you in the box. You look a certain way, you act a certain way, you know, you, you're going through those politics as well. There's multiple stories of multiple things, right? And um, I think... It got to, I think after two years in, I stayed, I was probably there for like, to like say like two to, no, I was there to, for like four to five years, right? But after two years in, every single night I drive to work, I'd be like, I'm going to quit. Yeah. Every night. For like two years, I'm like, I'm going to quit. 
I'm gonna quit. I'm gonna quit. And then like two, like I feel like three things happened in like quick succession. The first thing happened, and I'm not gonna like bore people because it's like very, it's 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 kind of hard to to kind of explain it. But um, basically, the, when we the the type of job we do is we're basically re uh, routing some of the electricity in simple terms, right? So when you go out on like the track, so you say like when you're on the Elizabeth line and you're on the train, we walk that track, but that line is like completely blocked. Mm -hmm. There'll be no trains on that line. There'll be trains on the line next to you. Long story short, the person who's giving my instructions, basically I'm supposed to check my instructions, but nobody does. You just take the lead of the person ab uh, um, that's above you that will give you instructions and say, okay, go to this side. That's where you access because that other side, the trains are still running. I'm walking down this, this like track, right? And I'm just walking and I just, and I'm with like my assistant, right? And I just, so something's just, 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 I don't know, like something's inside me and I'm like, it's like something's like burning. I'm like, I said, yo, like, Come off, come off the track quickly. Come off the track, come off the track. I tell, I kid you not. Like forty seconds later, train one hundred and ten miles an hour. <sighs> yeah, and I'm like, okay, cool. So we gotta like walk on the outside, get back or whatever. Call the guy. Yeah, he's giving us the run instructions, but technically it's my fault because you have to check. No one checks, but is what it is, whatever. And that's happened to several different people. Yeah. Right. I also saw like uh, I remember there was a guy who um who worked with. He was a like they called him the nicest racist. Uh, that wasn't a great term for me because I was like, "You guys know he's still a racist." And he's still a racist. It was mad. Ugh. But they, they, he, I remember him like killing himself right over some work issue, some work thing or whatever. I remember that night so clearly. But then I saw what happened when he killed himself. It was like, okay, everyone got the night off. Next night, everyone's back. Right, you literally just a number. Like, he, like no, I don't know if people mention him today. Right, people stopped mentioning him after like a week. It was done. They just continued with life, right? So that's the next thing. And then um, I'd also been vocal, right? So when I'd hear certain things that I felt was just wrong, that I felt like, you know, like this is like, you can't be saying these things to like people or whatever. I was one of the few people that would speak up, right? So, you know, I, I felt like there was like an agenda to kind of get me out because I'd speak up and, you know, say certain things. And um, I remember... I think it was like that night that I feel like I was really gonna quit. I'm driving to work, right? And I'm driving on the right lane and there's like a big like lorry on the like on the middle lane. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're just we're just driving. I think we're coming off the A road. It's still like I think it's about forty miles an hour. So I'm going forty miles an hour. This lorry I'm going fifty. I think it might have been fifty miles an hour. I feel like he's going slower or whatever, but I'm still going the speed limit. But he's gone slow to turn to turn right, right? So there's a big right turn. Yeah. But I can't see if he's indicating because we're You're side in the middle. by side. Yeah. I'm in the middle, right? So I'm still going as uh, where I'm going. And then he turns and luckily I kind of like swerve and go up on a hill. I've got my van, I'm like up on a hill, right? And at that point I was like, oh yeah, I'm gone. Yeah, I said, yeah, I'm gone. Yeah, I'm saying, I think God's given me enough signs. I'm gone. And I think, yeah, it, it didn't take long, but... I quit my job very abruptly. Yeah. Right. I remember my manager calling me about some stuff and whatever. And I was like, you know what? I fuck your job. That like, literally, I'd said that I said, word for word. I was like, oh, fuck your job. He's like, what? I said, yeah, yeah, fuck your job. He said, are you sure? I said, yeah, I'm sure. And that was it. Mm. And yeah. And that's how, you know, eventually kickstart we go to here. Damn. Damn. So all those signs That's what really told you Like those times ago Yeah like Because I started to think This is just too many bad yeah, things Happening in yeah, quick succession yeah. Like you've been saying You want to quit You Do you have to die to quit right mm. Like you need to Either pull the trigger Or stop talking about it and, you, know, you know what I mean Like I said to people oh, I don't want to be here Or whatever Like yeah, okay Do it then <laughs> But it's crazy though Because it's that that element when you're in a job and you do feel so comfortable it does need something quite drastic to move you out of it because like for some people it might be being made redundant or it might be someone close to them like passing away mm -hmm. i feel you do need those kind of like glitches in the matrix as it were to kind of make you reevaluate like 
what your own priorities are, what you want to be doing. And like, even if you don't want to have, even if you don't have a plan, mm -hmm. still making the decision that this is not where I want to be and still making an exit. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think, I think you definitely know those glitches. For me, I had way too many. Right? Yeah. And I think it was getting closer and closer to me being the glitch, bro. It's mm. like, um, it, all right, you need to quit now, right? Because this is what you've really been tossed to. At that time, I was like collecting rum at that time as well like learning about rum or whatever. So mm. all of these things are happening at that time. Um, and I don't know, like, like I, I think when I did quit, I had an idea that I wanted to do uh, Las Olas and I'd been collecting rum and I'd been learning about rum and travelled and stuff like that. Mm. But I, like I didn't know how to do it. Mm. I just knew I wanted to do it. So then between leaving yeah. and then kicking off Las Olas, like... What happened in that journey? Was you like figuring out the business plan, the idea, like the rum? Because I just came back from Barbados, yeah. yeah. And like, when did you go? Literally, like last week. I went uh, last week, well, two weeks ago, a week and a half ago. What is? I went, um, I got back last Thursday. Well, I got back on last Friday. It was probably, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah. yeah. Out so, yeah. like, um, Barbados is a beautiful country. Um, and it's one thing I don't get though is like they really don't talk about like, the history like slave or anything like that like they really shy away from but it which know, I find quite but, but you, you know, know what they're talking about yeah but you, but you know why you know they why they don't talk about because of the tourism yes but still I don't know I feel like you shouldn't Instead be running away from it but I get it like you don't want to like guilt people that are there but um, great experience and I think even for me like I love rum and I thought I knew rum but like there's so much more and even just going there going to like all the different um, like plantations the different factories um you want to buy all of them because you want to try all of them. You want to see all the differences. And I can only imagine when you're trying to start your own rum drink, there's so many different avenues you want to go down. Mm -hmm. So like, how were you thinking about that where you've already started collecting and now you're thinking of a business idea? Like what were the, and that's such a big jump, especially yeah. from just selling cars mm -hmm. in your spare time. Yeah, man. I think, I think it was more so the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial bug first. Mm -hmm. It's like that bug has always been in, uh, inside of me because from secondary school to thinking about property to trying something with cars. I've always tried something. The difference between uh, this and everything else is I generally loved this before the business. Yeah. So before thinking about business is I loved understanding the history. I loved collecting. I loved the actual product. I loved everything around it before saying, yo, um, let me make money off it. Uh, when I quit in, when I quit, um, I think it's twenty eighteen. Yeah, but I'm thinking about the date when I right. quit. Back end, I'll tell you like when I quit the back end of twenty eighteen, mm. I had like done some work with okay, I want to start this brand. I'd like for okay, I'd, I'd come up with a name like that's all that means the waves. We want to be like the new wave of rum. Um, I'd thought about like different things, but. Uh, had no licenses in place, had, like, I didn't even know, like, really where to start, to source, and all these other things. I would just, like, done a, some Googles and stuff like that. So when I quit, I think it kind of put myself into, like, gear and say, all right, cool, you got to really figure this out, bro, mm -hmm. because you quit without no plan. You know you, you want to do this. I did um, register the business earlier on in that year as well, but, like, that was it. Mm. It was just a registered business with the name and yeah, that was it. Everything else after that, it's just like through fortune, mm -hmm. through network um, and through perseverance. Um, that's how, you know, a year later we get licenses, we have a solid business plan and we launch with like our first product, um, November the 11th, 2019. That's know. still so quick. Like I think... But launching a rum business is mm. such an ambitious type of business yeah. because of all the hurdles that you have mm. to jump. For me, like having an alcohol business, you could compare it to like having a fintech yeah. because of all the regulations and all the things you have to like jump through. So did you have anyone kind of guiding you through what you need to do? Like, how did you navigate that? I'll tell you a funny story. So when uh, in 2018, uh, when I would like searched for rum brands, uh, so when I'd searched rum on, on Google, there, I think there might have been like one rum distillery. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I went up there and when I went up there, 
he was t- he was teaching me, but he didn't know he was teaching me. Mm. He was like, "Oh, have you got this license? Have you got that license? Have you got this?" I was like, "Yeah," but I was writing <laughs> it down. I was right because I thought you could just go out there and buy the product, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when he when he taught me that, when he was like, "Oh, have you got this license? This license? This license?" I was like, oh, "Shit, I ain't got none of this shit." Yeah, I was like, "Oh, cool. Yeah, I'll be back. I I got I got one of them, but I need to get the rest." So that was literally it. So I went there. He taught me bare shit. Then after he taught me the stuff, I then went on obviously Google and stuff mm-hmm. like that and um, started to learn about those specifically specific license. And then in actually getting those licenses, you have to have a solid business plan, right? So working with people then that are like, whether it was like, I was I went on like a, I went with, uh, went on like a gig website. So someone that could, who could help me, like I did, the, the business plan but some of like the data stuff in like alcohol that I didn't know or whatever someone was helping me with that I was like oh Sick. okay like so then I just started to then I created this business plan so the business aspect of it I was like okay cool but then the alcohol aspect of it I was like getting from the internet or mm. g- getting it from like people that helped me or whatever so by the time I got to the end of you know the business plan and the first business plan was horrible, by the way. It's like I got rejected. They're like, "Are you crazy?" Like I feel it might have been like two pages. My my, <laughs> my, my last business plan was like a hundred pages or whatever. But wow. yeah, um, and then I remember getting to the end of it and then having learned a lot. But again, I didn't know, I didn't know much. I just knew what I needed to like get the licenses. And I think after that, it's just experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How what about financially as well then? So as I said, electrical engineer, you kind of work nights and. I'd save my money to get into property, mm. but I made like on a proper to this day, it was definitely the best decision. All the money I saved for like my mortgage and my property, plus like my friends who came into the business with me, just dumped it in straight in. Just effort. <laughs> effort. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the thing is, and what was what was really motivating me to do that yeah. is because people people are not willing to go to zero. Mm. Like and that's a, that's what that that that's what separates a lot of people is a lot of people are not willing to go to zero, it, like uh, especially like people that come from our culture. But especially like if, if you, you the whole thing is to buy the house, bro. The whole mm. thing is to work, get your mortgage, buy the house. That's like a that's what success looks like. You know, uh, in like nine out of ten homes from our culture is you know look after your family, buy your house, go holidays or whatever. But that wasn't what success looked like to me. So in my head, I was like, all right, we've got this money for a mortgage, mm-hmm. money that I saved up for from being an electrical engineer, from working crazy hours, when it's sometimes 12 hours, sometimes 16 hours, you know, taking extra shifts, double shifts, Christmas shifts, Christmas shifts where you get paid three, four times your wage, et cetera, et cetera. Working on Christmas Day, Boxing Day, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, like mm-hmm. really, really like grafting um, all that money put into to this see it's, it's interesting i was having this conversation literally yeah. today with my friend about yeah. like going to zero yeah. and like gambling basically putting a bet on yeah. what you want to do so like because at that point you hadn't even had one customer yet mm. so what was giving you like the conviction to go to zero and fully bet on that self-belief bro yeah like uh, i i believed in myself and i believed in my idea like i believed in my idea i knew like even up until today, I did. Don't, I don't think there's like a product like this in regards to like what we stand for, the branding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I I believed in my idea. There was like, there was like I don't, bro. It's like it's, if you don't believe in your idea, or if you don't hundred percent believe in your idea, you might as well just not start, right? Because um, like it's so it's so difficult, and we can we we'll obviously get onto it. But entrepreneurship is so crazy, mm. and I didn't even know how crazy it was then. Mm. But I just had so much belief, bro. I had so much belief at the start. I have so much belief now. But especially when you even think about COVID and all these other things, you're like, I've got so much belief that this is the right thing to do. There's nothing like this, and I really love this, mm. right? That I'm just happy. Like if I have to go to zero, and you know, definitely was very close. If I have to go to, to zero, like actually I was a month away by the way. Like if I have to go to zero, um I'm happy to go to zero. Yeah. And and then what I will do is use the experience from this and get a job somewhere mm. and make money again and do whatever, whatever. But yeah, like, you know, I, it, it, that was almost a reality in twenty twenty one in COVID. Yeah. So 
Yeah. What happened? So, you know, I'd left my job. I'd put money in this. Me and my friends had put money in this. Um, he started the brand with me. Again, they're just working guys, right? And um, I've got Runway, right? So Runway is my savings. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. So your friends are still working whilst you're doing yeah, yeah, full-time all, business. Yeah, yeah. So I'm full-time this. Yeah. I'm, I'm going full-time with this. Uh, but I'm living off my savings. Luckily, at that time, I was like living at my parents' house and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, COVID, right? You know, we our plan. My whole my whole plan was um, I want to start the brand. I want to be DTC for like the first year or two. Yeah, first year, sorry. And then once I've been DTC for a year, to go to bars, to restaurants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, <laughs> you know, COVID was 2020, right? Mm-hmm. So I launched four months before COVID. So all of that plans out the window, right? So now I'm D to C for the first year, which is fine. But the next year, which was part of our plan to go into bars and restaurants, still exist, yeah. right? So the alcohol industry is about scale. You like, you know, you need to, you can, you know, you could sell a thousand bottles, you can sell two thousand bottles, whatever, whatever. But you really need to be selling thousands and thousands of bottles per month or whatever to really move the needle because you need to pay your wage, you need to pay whoever your hiring's wave, etc. But we wasn't able to scale. So it means that the bottles that we'll say, sell in DTC, which weren't like amazing numbers or whatever, are not enough to sustain or take anything from the business. Mm. So with that, it was like, okay, we, we, we sell. So we know we have product market fit because we're selling, but we have no money for ads because I'm runway. There's no marketing budget. <laughs> <laughs> we have um, no money for ads. Like we really, we can't do anything out of home because we're stuck in, you know, the office. I've got yeah. a warehouse. The only reason why I have this warehouse is an expense because I need to pack boxes in there and s- stuff like that to send the orders out and stuff like that. So really and truly, I'm just like coasting and I'm basically dying a slow death, mm. really. Uh, so yeah, like I think 2021, in the back end of 2021, we uh, get some investment. Right, and that really like saves the brand. Really, yeah. How long did it take to close that investment? It it closed. Well, the conversation maybe started like two or three months before. Okay, that's quite quick then. Yeah, it was quick. I'm not yeah. gonna lie. Like conversation started two, and the thing is, it's not that I had not been looking for investors. Oh my god, <laughs> I was looking for investors from day one. <laughs> from day one, I was on LinkedIn. Yeah. I had crazy insomnia. It was so bad I had to take sleep. I, I used to have to take sleeping pills, yeah. bro, because I'll be up on LinkedIn. Inv- inviting everybody, mm. inviting everyone's <laughs> investor, their wife, whoever, bro, their kids. I'm adding everyone on LinkedIn because I need you to invest in this brand, bro. And we, the, some of the stuff that we got back was just hilarious. Like I know invest, like again, the brand's nowhere near like scaled or made it or whatever. But mm. like people are just not hearing it. Like alcohol brand, this guy, this is foreign. Now it's like now you probably could get investment from if you've got like a, a good product or whatever. But at that time it was like completely foreign. People were like, no, like oh your valuation is too high or mm-hmm. no, nah, this don't make no sense. I don't think you can make it or nah, rum industry is too hard or like where are you gonna get your first customer or all that. we we always hearing everything like everything and yeah like. Again, I just think timing. Um, and the thing is as well, it's so crazy that even when I got uh, hundreds and hundreds of no's or hundreds and hundreds of not interested or whatever, I still said, oh, yeah, we're going to get an investor. You get some guys. I said, oh, yeah, 100%. Because in my head, I was like, why not? Like, I didn't, I invested in this. This makes sense. <laughs> like, And that's what I'm saying. You had that, I had that delusion where I'm like, oh, yeah. Mm. Of course we're gonna get investor. Like one hundred, like someone eventually is gonna invest in it. Mm. Like e- even when we was a bit like a month away, because from closing, I was like, no, sorry. Even before it was a month away, before the first conversation had started with like our investors or whatever, I was like, oh, like yeah, hundred percent. Someone like something's gonna happen before before I run up my run before my runway runs out. Something is one hundred percent gonna happen. Mm. I just always believe that. Yeah, that's right. cool. Which is crazy, like, when I think about it. But when I speak back to my boys, I'm like, bro, everything I said, it yeah, happened. it happened. Because mm. uh, there's two I'm thinking. All right, first question, actually. So in some businesses, you might have someone who's doing the business full-time mm-hmm. and you've got business partners who are still working full-time job. Mm-hmm. How do you manage that relationship? Because they don't really understand the pressure that you're under and you don't understand the pressure that they're under as well. I, mar- I managed it horribly at the start. Yeah. 
horribly because one, you're projecting feelings that they can't see. Right? Exactly. So like you're frustrated, you're thinking about your whole life and they're like doing whatever they do, right? Whatever. Of course they've given you capital and but you're also you've also put capital plus over your life. time. Yeah. Right. So that's something that they didn't understand. I don't know if they totally understand till today, right, what that's like. Mm-hmm. But you know, you're 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 doing that. Um so I managed it horribly at the start. I think towards the end, tough decisions. Like you need to make tough decisions and say we didn't do this properly first time because we didn't have the knowledge. We didn't know that this is how the company should be split up. We didn't know that this is how the work in life or the day-to-day of the company should be or whatever. So eventually when you get the knowledge, retrospectively, you have to try to fix things. Mm -hmm. Now this is where friendship comes into play because people say don't get into business with friends. I think if I hadn't have got into business with friends, this wouldn't have been resolved in the way that it it had to be resolved, which is them understanding the role I'm playing and the role that they play. Um, maybe they don't until today. I don't mm, know. But yeah. it got resolved regardless, right? And I think that's like super important is, um, yeah, because I was definitely building up resentment and I had to like, if I don't like say what the cold hard facts of this is, I'm just, we're just going to fall out. Mm. So I think eventually someone has to s- come out and say what the cold hard facts of this is and really like steer the ship. Like we're going to crash into a wall if I don't do this, mm. right? And that's what I did. Because when you, because you said about um, resentment building yeah. up. So was you a little bit like avoiding the conflict and no, having no, no. those tough conversations? I tried to with? bring up the conversation, but mm. I, did, I was not bringing it up in a way that was a conversation. I just say something. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I just say something. I was like, uh, this is shit, man. We need to put in more work. I'll yeah. say something like that. Right? Yeah. This, this is what I'm saying. Uh, like, bro, we need to like we need to graph harder. Like, I, but I wasn't having that conversation. I wasn't saying, yeah. Like, look, this is where it is, right? This is all of the, we needed to have a shareholders agreement before we started, mm-hmm. right? We needed to get the business correct before we started. We needed to understand the roles before we started. We needed to have it in writing before we started. And that's again a thing that you don't really learn. Like, I, I didn't go uni, right? And um, if you don't go uni, you're not really learning that like within our community. It's not that we don't have that information. Yeah. Right. So uh once I got that information, yeah, I I I I and the thing is with me is one, like uh th- I think one thing that kind of like saved the relationship is people know I'm not money oriented. Mm. So they know this is not a selfish decision. It actually it is a selfish decision, but you know it's not money driven. This is hundred percent like this is just right. Like you, we need to fix this, yeah. or this is gonna be shit. It's gonna be fucked. We might as well just pack up shop. Mm-hmm. So I think um, uh, people understanding that I'm not driven by money made the conversation digestible, mm-hmm. right? Not easy, but digestible. Um, and um, also me having a strong character, right? Like I, uh, my like close circle group or whatever, I have like a strong character. Like not to say oh I'm the leader of the group or whatever they say on the internet, <laughs> but I'm saying like, like, like what's right is right, what's wrong is wrong. Mm. I'm always on the side of like if this is wrong, I'm gonna say it's wrong, and if this is right, I'm gonna say it's right. But I'm vocal, like my I don't I don't have the filter, mm. right? So I think again that's what made the conversation easier is because they know that one this guy's not money hungry, but two like. When we think about it, he just he says his mind, and yeah. this is like real. Yeah, no, I love that. I love yeah. that. I love that because especially like sometimes you can put your friendships on the line, and you're worried about them being destroyed by being real and being open and being honest. But sometimes you need someone who's going to be having those tough conversations because it does make your relationship stronger. I reckon. Bro, I was looking at it as like it's either the friendship has to die, yeah, or I have to go on zero. Yeah, no, like that doesn't make sense. Like, mm. I'd, like. If 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 I went to zero, then the friendship would have died because exactly. I would have just hated you. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, so yeah, basically that either the two had to happen. Mm. And then talking of character, like what I've noticed with Las Olas is that it's got a very strong, prominent character, like online. Mm. Um, because I remember, like even on the launch, like you got people posting, say, "Oh yeah, I got my bottle, mm. this and the other." So, talk me a little bit through around like how you launch the business as well, like how you were able to kind of build up that kind of community for the business, which still is strong up even up to today. Yeah, I appreciate that. So, I think like using social media. 
um, was like one of our one of my gifts, right? Is using social media, having a presence on there, um, and, and having uh, day one supporters, right, of an idea. Yeah. Um, DLT massive for us because uh, MK, who's like a, a, a close friend of mine, I, I like to call him a close friend or a friend at least um, of mine. Um, he he definitely gave me the platform, right? Meaning, like. I was allowed to go there. I was allowed to the money, the, the small money that we had for like anything. I bought cups, us, and then people had like the LL cups. So mm. I, I, started, I started posting this on like Twitter. I was like, "This is what the branding may look like, or whatever." So then I bought cups, and then I go to DLTs, and then I'd like put all the drinks in those cups. I'd go to festivals, and then I'd swap people's. I'd have cups in my bag. I'd swap people's cups, get people to take picture of like the cups and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny, bro. It's so funny now, but get people to take pictures of the cups. I remember my, my friend Whitney. Um, she she used to work for Live Nation, and they had like a festival. And obviously, you got all the big brands there. And I was in the VIP area, swapping people's cups with the mm. LO cups. Right, so I was like hustling like that, and then again, as I said, DLTs was massive. And then I remember going to DLTs, and then I remember having like our old bottle, and then people taking pictures with it because again, people really loved the bottle and they'll take pictures with it. And it was just like a thing, right? People were just taking pictures with it. And then I had like a sample, and then I go to another DLT, and I, I was like, the, the venue would be pissed because they're like, like, why is this guy giving free alcohol to people or whatever? I'll be like pouring a bit of La Solas in people's drinks and stuff mm. like that for them to get a sample. And people were like, again, fucking with the sample, they, they liked it or whatever. Um, and um, yeah, bro, I think I did like a bunch of that for a while. And then I remember like selling hoodies before we, we actually launched to see if like people would buy anything from us. Um, and people bought the hoodies. People still rock the hoodies until today. I saw wow. the hoodie like last, from 2019. I saw it like the other day. Wow. Somebody had it. And I was like, okay, this is cold. Um, and then, yeah, man, just like we, we eventually launched. But it's so funny. Prior to that, when I was figuring out the branding, I even remember doing an exercise. And again, people might think this is weird or whatever, but I'd go to like bars and see like, oh, how are people ordering their spice rum or their rum? Mm -hmm. I'd be you standing there. People might think this guy's weird, but I'm like, oh, like, do they say them. like, yeah, like, <laughs> like, are they saying rum and coke? Are they saying mm -hmm. rum and da, da? And do you know what I've realized is, um, it, it's kind of changing now, but people never cared what rum they had in their drink. Yeah, and that's yeah. when I knew there was space for me, bro, because mm -hmm. it, it was like, oh, can I just have a rum and coke? Can I just have a rum and ginger ale? Even if you listen to people, if people have time, go listen to people by the bar, order rum. Nine times out of 10, they're never going to call the brand by name. And I mm -hmm. always used to say that. Not calling the brand by name, they're saying, oh, can I have a rum? And I was like, okay, like there's an opportunity here then, right? Is it, you know, they're not calling brands by name. Mm -hmm. I now know how all of that works, right? In regards to what brands get chosen and stuff like that. When when you're ordering that, I also remember like going to parties. I remember uh, one of my friends, like Maximum, who's Skeptics DJ, had a party it's called No Mercy, and then seeing artists in there, like musicians and that, going to them, showing them like the first design of our bottle. Some artists were giving me time, some artists weren't giving me time or whatever. But then like seeing like, what do they think? Would you buy this? Would you buy that? buy this buy that so I've done a lot of that stuff man I've done a lot of like doing like groundwork mm -hmm. right um, and a lot of sampling a lot of that like marketing that that till today like I only realised oh this is actually genuine marketing I just thought I was just hustling and mm -hmm. you know or whatever but this is like textbook you know it's good guerrilla marketing right guerrilla marketing yeah. textbook guerrilla marketing it's so funny I bought a book called guerrilla marketing and I never read it but then I just implemented it <laughs> yeah so it's crazy that's dope yeah. I think even the point that you mentioned about social media like when you can gain a big following it yeah. can like do so much for your brand yeah. but on the other side it's like if you do something wrong if you make one step wrong it's like you can lose everything yeah. what are your thoughts around like building up your base on social media versus looking at other channels to begin with. I think it's I think it's I think it's important to use social media as a tool, right? Versus um living on there. Like I mean, yeah, I think you can you, you, you live by the sword, die by the sword, right? And then I think eventually you, you're gonna put something out of place. Mm. I don't think the people that kill you on social media are the ones that are buying your brand though. I think the ones that kill you on social media may follow your brand, may like your brand, but I don't think most of them will be purchasers of that brand. I do think 
your core supporters will give you rope, right? They'll give you a chance to kind of apologize or give you a chance to, they'll probably even defend you. Yeah. And what I'm looking for is like loyal supporters, bro. I'm not, I'm not like, I, I, I want as many people to buy Las Olas as possible. But if I step out there, step outside and be a founder or whatever and be human, humans make mistakes. Mm. You know, there's obviously some things that you, you know, you can't say or you can't come back from or whatever, but mistakes are mistakes, bro. Like if if I'm if I'm going through life and I'm not even talking about stuff in the bar, I'm talking about like right now. Right now people can make mistakes. And if I'm like saying stuff, if I'm doing stuff or whatever and I say things that offend people and I think and I think back, oh that that's offensive, I can apologize and move on. And I think the core supporters that really rock with your brand or rock with your personality will forgive you and the ones that don't don't have you cast up in that has something like that happened to you? No, but like I wouldn't, you know, if if it does happen, then it does, right? I think, um, again, as a, a human, and I want to be as human as possible, right? I don't want to be a robot. So, as I said, I'm going to step out and do like founder face and stuff, and I'm going to do something. And I don't know, let's say I did an interview with somebody, and this person is hated by this person, and then by proxy of me doing the interview, this person, I get hated yeah. or whatever. Mm. I, I can't avoid. I can't avoid that. Mm. Like it, it just is where it is, right? I think me as a person, like now 2024, me as a person, I genuinely think I'm like a super nice and caring person. So that's at the forefront of everything I do. Like uh, as in, I do so much things that people will never see, never hear about, just cause it's just in my heart to just do these things. So again, if I make a mistake, I will know it's genuinely a mistake. But if I stand on it, I also stand on it as well. Mm, yeah. Love that. I'm talking about mistakes, but also like naivety. Mm. So has it been like times when you've been naive? Because I, I would, I, when I think of the alcohol industry in just general, mm. it seems that there's a lot of like wolves, there's a lot of sharks in there. Like, have you had an experience of people like biting you in that yeah, way? Yeah, loads, yeah. man. Up until today, like I can call a name, but I just... <sighs> Anyway, up until today, yeah. <laughs> up until today, there's like many people, like there's yeah. many people that will like block you from being in bars, right? Partnerships, right? You see, well, literally like personally block like, you. Yeah, like, oh, don't stop this brand because of this or da 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 da, da or whatever. Or let's say there's a partnership going on and, you know, people will see this, but say there's a partnership going on and, you know, it's a culture or whatever. And uh, they will say, no, nah, I don't want this brand to be on a bar. Mm. Of course, it's like business or whatever, but it's also, you know, you know what you're doing. I also believe, and this is not me being big-headed or me, like, saying something out of term, I've changed the marketing of a lot of brands, mm. right, for, for the negative and positive. In a positive sense is I've seen two particular brands, and I can't mention them because it's peak, specifically target, like, the same partnerships, and them like, global brands. But... Again, I know how they, I know why they target and I know how they've managed to, like, why they're in this space, mm -hmm. which I can't speak more on, but I've seen the shift, right? Um, I've also seen, like, smaller brands, like, again, like, target certain things that I've done. Um, so, yeah, man, I think definitely it's like, it's a, it's a sharp game. Mm -hmm. It's a sharp game and, um, you know, it's, you know, it's not, a, for me, it's not kill or be killed. But for me, what it is, is that, you know, you have to continue to carve your own lane. Mm. Like you need to continue to go your direction because you need to be, you need to be the trendsetter versus being reactionary. Mm. And I think that's what continues, allows uh, that, that's what allows us to continue to try to, to, to thrive, I guess, uh, is we just, we're just doing our own thing. It's interesting you mentioned about trendsetter because... I always remember like at uni the the lesson around like first mover advantage mm. where you have the advantage of being a first mover but also everyone behind you sees, sees all the mistakes. mistakes that you do mm. and can basically just slot in yeah. all the gaps that you're doing so there's a lot of pressure being the first mover and probably not as much freedom especially as the market becomes more like congested or more mm. competitive right so like do you feel that pressure as well then would you 100%. say yeah 100% I, I definitely feel that pressure is like the first mover uh, but again what I try to do is but I'm I'm like 100% confident in our product like 
I think the the one of the key things with like this and this industry is you can have great marketing, you mm. can do like great things, but if you haven't got great liquids, you're cooked. <laughs> like you're pretty much cooked, right? So, mm. and I think a lot of people have great marketing, but they have horrible liquid. Yeah. Some people have great liquid, but they have horrible marketing. Yeah. For us, we think like we have both. Yeah. And I think that's what like separates us from a lot of other brands. Um uh so yeah there's there's definitely pressure but i'm like confident and we have like our own direction we want to go um and by the end of 2024 i think it'll be clear as a brand like what we stand for what we're doing the direction we're going down and all of the stuff that we've done that's quite different to Mm. what everybody else is doing so you spend a lot of time like on the business and like making sure that that is in a good place but then what about yourself like how do you continue to like grow yourself from a personal perspective like keep your mindset straight and not burn out like how do you how do you cope with that stuff i think i think last year was massive for me because i put on a bunch of weight from like covid and just being in my warehouse just ordering takeouts and stuff like that um and mentally last year was hard because obviously the brands out in market was out of stock we didn't sell a bottle from december 2022 to December no to no well D to C to December first twenty twenty three mm-hmm. did so one book. so we did a bunch of events we did some stuff or whatever just to keep up momentum but you know you're there you're thinking about like life you're going through personal things like I remember like losing someone so close to me like who basically raised me as a child you're going through big business problems but imagine you're going through big business problems you're meeting with different agencies you're trying to figure that out why you're going through personal shit but time has to con- you have to continue life goes, to- on. life goes on like nobody like it's so bad but nobody cares yeah and it's like it's so crazy like and it's not that you know you express these things because you know you have to be able to kind of like compartmentalize some of these issues and continue to move forward mm. but even if you did tell people tomorrow okay I need this, like the bottle needs to come out right there's people's money on on play or whatever so mm. you know that you go through that like last year and then um yeah just like other stuff and then i think just like one day bro i was like okay 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 what you can do for yourself is get back into the gym what you can do for yourself is just start running no, I started walking first, right? Mm-hmm. Started walking and I just started like listening to podcasts. Like I listen to podcasts anyway, always been a, a avid podcast listener, but I started to like listen to more podcasts, more audio books, started to like walk for an hour or two hours every single day and just be with my thoughts. Uh, I used to take calls on walks, I used to like solve business uh, like issues on walks um, and that gave me like some it just gave me time to reflect gave me time to think and then I started running and running is interesting for me because even when I was playing football I wasn't I didn't I didn't run hard like I didn't I, I was a, I was fast mm. but I did not I w- I, I'm not somebody who who was um, who had crazy stamina etc or whatever I never really like trained i never trained hard when they were doing this running drills or whatever so this so last year i start running and i start like short distance and then i kind of start to understand oh shit this is about mental strength bro this is about you versus you right and this is about like mental reps every time you run it's a rep like every you're thinking sometimes your mind is just blank and i started to find like peace in like running Right, and then once I started to find peace in running, like the way how I speak now, the way how my business has come together, the decisions I've made became easier to make. It's so I I don't even know where it is, bro. Mm. But the decisions became easier to make. Everything became way clearer. The way again, as I'm saying, the way I articulate myself now versus the way how I articulated myself a year ago, way different. Um, everything just became clearer and it started to maybe solve some of the internal things that I was going through at that time and it was my outlet and still is my outlet until this day and now I'm doing a lot of like high, like high rock stuff, gym stuff or whatever and that's really like really helping but also like I love this brand, right? Mm. So, you know, it, even though you're going through like tough stuff or whatever, I love the product, I love the industry, right? So like that's also been cool for me because had had this been something I didn't love like let's say property 
or like cars or whatever, then you're just kind of like down in the mud and I don't know what can kind of get you out of that rut. Mm. However, because I love this, mixed with all the stuff I'm doing outside of this and the walking, the running, etc., or whatever, I'm able to kind of uplift my spirits to something I really enjoy pretty easily. And then uh, mentally, you know, I have the challenge of trying to create something that's never been kind of done before from someone that's, you know, never had the background of somebody um, like, like myself uh, and kind of create history. And that kind of motivates me and fills me with happiness and fills me with like, yeah, with kind of like joy of the possibilities. Mm. So what would you say your purpose is? Would you say it's like bringing the stuff to the forefront? Or do you yeah, say? like, yeah, my, my, my purpose, like, so my, I, I have two purposes, right? I have um, like the purpose from a business perspective is uh, like creating like a, a spirits brand f- um, where people can see a founder from the craziest background uh, do something that they could have never imagined, mm-hmm. right? And um, that kind of folds into my per- my life purpose, which is to affect people. Right, I want to affect people in a positive way. Um, I talk about things that I've done. And like one of the things that I'd say that I've done that nobody knows that I've done is before I started this, right? And I, when I quit, I went into a school in Hackney and I used to spend time, right, by myself with my own money, buying them books and then just getting them to problem solve. Because I felt like that was like massive for me growing up is I didn't know how to problem solve. Like it was just emotions, it was just fighting, it was just this, this, this. There was no problem solving. So it kind of goes back to like my main mission is I want to affect people in a positive way. I want to change lives. I want to change directions. I want to show people that you can become this regardless. You could become anything, right? Mm. Like nothing is out of the realm of possibilities. Like me being here today, haven't done this, haven't done what we've done, even if it's so small. We've worked with Nike, we've worked with Stormzy, we've worked with Adidas, we've worked with LVMH, we've worked with Stella McCartney, we've worked with Google, YouTube. We've worked with so many people where, bro, like you know that is just an achievement in itself bro mm. like and then you know to get investors on that's like back to and believe in your vision as well like you know it's not something i like celebrate or shout about or whatever because there's still so much work to be done mm-hmm. but it makes it, it sh- hopefully should inspire people to say oh okay like i can become you know something or i can do something or whatever it is really so yeah just to affect people i think in a positive way no i love that i love that yeah. thank you sammy this has been amazing so i've got a couple quick fire questions yeah, before we roll yeah yeah so first one um what's one book that changed your perspective on something i'm gonna say shoe dog mm-hmm. shoe dog because uh you just understand like resilience right you understand resi- that's that's basically what that is it's resilience elite marketing rolling the desk Rolling the dice, man. It's getting up. Yeah. And yeah, that's that's probably the, the book. Um, what's one piece of advice that you hear people say all of the time yeah. and they think it's good advice, but you actually think it's bad advice? Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> um, uh, balance. Like people talk about balance. I don't think there's a thing. Balance. Interesting. I don't, I don't. I genuinely don't think there's a thing called balance, right? And I'm starting to understand that now. Mm. And I understood that last year is like people strive for balance. I just don't think it exists. I don't think you can be perfectly balanced and have a high growth. Actually, you probably can. I'm sure there's anomalies, and somebody can say, "Yeah, but this person, cool." But I'm saying nine times out of ten, I don't think there's a such thing called balance you have to give up your weekends you have to give up your nights you have to give up your morning you have to give up sometimes yourself mentally right sometimes you, you don't you're not yourself or whatever so I don't think there's something called balance but what I do think you can do is try to offset that with some form of routine for people in your life but it balance doesn't exist yeah um, one piece of advice you wish you had earlier uh, it gets better Right, I think like it gets better. It's definitely something, but also it's gonna be shit. Mm-hmm. Right? Is uh, actually that's the advice I wish I heard. Uh, someone who sold one of their alcohol brands told me this is shit ninety percent of the time. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and that's probably the best advice to give to entrepreneurs. Is some entrepreneurship is glorified, 
but it's shit 90% of the time, mm. right? You do get small wins or whatever, but most of the time you're just trying to fight little fires or whatever. You're going through some stresses. Like in the back of my mind, I'm, in my head, I already know I, I'm fin- I've been here, but in my head, I've already, I had the list of problems that I've got to figure out or try to solve as soon as I leave here. It's on my mind, right? Mm. So it's shit 90% of the time. Um, and nobody really says that. So I was so happy that he said that because I was feeling that. I was like, this is fucking shit. But I love this. <laughs> but this is this is abusive. This is an abusive relationship. Like, yeah. I love this. But this is fucking shit most of the time. Yeah. yeah. And um, I'm trying, I'm t- I'm, I've got this as a new one. Yeah. So for my next guest, mm. what would your words of encouragement be for them? Are they, would they be an entrepreneur? It's up to you. Whatever your spirit tells you. What does your spirit tell you to be their next words of encouragement for them? Hmm. This is not negative, right? But I think, like, sometimes it's okay to give up, like, if you don't love something. Oof, okay. Right? It's okay to give up if you don't love something, man. I think um, some people are like, like, if I didn't love this, this would be over, mm. right? Like, but I love this. Mm. And, and this is, like, yeah, it's, all, it's had my 100% from the start. Right, so if you can't give a hundred percent from the start, it's, it's okay, bro. It's like you can figure it out. You can, or it's just like you can figure it out. You can figure something else out. Love. You can love something else. I've highlighted this. Oh, That's the message for you. Yeah, yeah, cool. And then final, final, final question: Where can people find you? Uh, so the Rum Rockstar on Instagram. Uh, which I'm trying to like grow my personal profile. I'm trying to do a bit more. Uh, but Lasolas UK, Lasolas.uk, uh, Lasolas.co.uk. Um, and yeah, just look out. We've got a lot of content coming, blogs coming, video content coming. Um, and yeah, thank you for supporting the journey. Awesome. Thank you so much, my bro. Appreciate it, my bro. Thank you. Take care.